good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome okay. again to our Survive and Thrive series, the fourth of our webinars, and thank you for joining us, and, um, and a special welcome today to our, uh, our guest, um, Anna Bly, who will be formally introduced shortly. Um, while this event is being delivered across multiple locations, I would like to acknowledge that the Hunter Business Chamber operates across the traditional lands of the Awabakal and the Waramai people, and I pay respects to the past and present, to elders past and present, and future knowledge holders. I also extend a warm welcome to any Indigenous people who are joining us today. Well, ladies and gentlemen, one of the strengths of the Hunter Business Chamber um, has always been its ability to provide our members with uh, the opportunity to hear from high profile expert speakers. And, and we believe these sorts of insights are needed now more than ever. Um, it's a shame that we're not able to continue to deliver our face-to-face um, -face events program and we do th thank you and value your support that you're giving us um, for this webinar series. Today we are privileged to have have one of the Australia, have one of Australia Banking Association CEO Anna Bly with us who will speak about the bank's response to the coronavirus crisis and the, the assistance that the banks are providing to business and how these measures are being taken up. We know this is a very um, uh, important topic and one of great interest to businesses across the Hunter region. We'll also have an interactive Q&A running throughout the event, so please feel free to post your questions um, through the webinar on the live chat and we'll do our best to, to moderate and, and pose those to, uh, to Anna at the appropriate time. I'm now going to hand over to Amy Delore, our Public Affairs and Policy Manager with the Chamber who will introduce our guest speaker and facilitate the discussion. So thank you, Amy, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Bob, and welcome to everybody. Uh, our special guest today, Anna Bly, is no doubt well known to you all. She's a woman who's not unaccustomed to dealing with a crisis situation, and many of you will remember the inspiring and uh, reassuring leadership that she displayed as Premier of Queensland during the floods in 2011. Uh, in 2017, she took the role of CEO of the Australian Banking Association and then was plunged into the swirling waters of the Banking Royal Commission, which um, was established later that year. Emerging from that challenging period, she now finds herself at the front line of the COVID-19 crisis, coordinating the response from banks, um, which is going to be critical to the national effort of, uh, in helping business and our community get through this um, period and to what Scott Morrison refers to as the other side. So welcome to you, Anna Bly. Great to be here. Um, and it's going to give us an overview of the measures the banks are offering um, to assist business through this period and then be available to answer questions. Um, but Anna, just before we, we move into that, uh, I wanted to ask you, the banks were very quick off the mark with getting this assistance package together. I think it was about March 20 or so that it was announced. So only a week or so after the first stimulus package and a couple of days after the federal government's second package. Um, how did you go out the process of actually corralling all the members and um, getting them to sort of agree to these really, you know, sort of unprecedented measures, considering, of course, that they were, the banks themselves were going to take a hit from this, which is, you know, now with something we're now seeing through the financial results that, are, that have been um, announced in the last few weeks. Uh, thanks, Amy. Uh, I think it was, it's important to, I think, think about this by comparison to something like the GFC which was a very serious economic crisis. But in that crisis, banks were the weak point. Banks and financial institutions around the world uh, were the weakness in the economy. Going into this crisis, um, I think Australians can be very thankful that uh, a lot of the lessons learned from the GFC have been put in place in the subsequent decade. And they've gone into this crisis uh, stronger um, than they've ever been uh, among the best capitalised banks in the world very strong balance sheets and re ready and able to play the part that you would want banks to play um, in a crisis of this nature. So in this crisis, banks, um, banks have the ability to be the strength, uh, to be the shock absorbers, if you like, for what is happening across the broader economy. Um, it was, whenever there is a natural disaster, you know, bushfires or floods, banks, um, banks always deal one-on-one -on -one with customers and put in place sort of tailored individual um, hardship packages to get them through. Uh, what was clear in relation to this crisis very early on, even in that first week uh, that you talked about, Amy, that this was going to be of an unprecedented scale. And it was very clear to me that going out and trying to tell the Australian public and bank customers what help might be available would be almost impossible if every bank had something different. 
And right now there is so much information being poured out of our televisions and radios every day. The more consistent we could be, the simpler we could be, then the more people were going to get the message about what help they could get when they needed it. So, you know, it, it's always interesting in an industry association um, around the table, everybody in the room is a competitor. They're all trying to take each other's customers every day and that's what we would want as consumers. But this sort of effort requires a degree of collaboration, which, you know, I'll be honest, is, you know, quite rightly doesn't necessarily come naturally. Um, it's not in their DNA to have, you know, conversations where they're disclosing some things which are of a commercial nature. So we had to get um, authorization from the ACCC to have the conversation. And to their credit, they moved very quickly on that. Uh, and there was no reticence around the table about wanting to help customers, but trying to find a package that was helpful and could be supported by every bank, because remember, they're all different shapes and sizes. Uh, you know, it, it did take a lot of thinking and a lot of commitment from those CEOs. But uh, as you'll see, when I outline the offers, the opportunities that are there, I think they've come up with something that's very workable and very practical and helpful to customers. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, now, I believe you're going to move into a presentation and give us a bit of an overview of the assistance measures that, that are being offered by the banks and how they're being taken up by business. And I encourage people, if you have questions, please put them up on the um, live chat as we go. This is, uh, I know the team from the Australian Banking Association are very keen on this being a a two-way feedback session. They're interested in hearing from you as we indeed are hearing in hearing from Anna. So, Anna, if you could move into that presentation now. Sure. So I think Lisa's going to bring it up on the screen. Thank you. Um, okay. So, as we've indicated at the beginning, banks are um, able to provide some very practical assistance. So, if we can just go to the first slide, Lisa. So in short, and I will go into each of these in more detail, banks are able to defer mortgage repayments for up to six months and to do that without impacting a customer's credit record. Uh, they have um, sought and got agreement with the credit agencies that they will not record these, de these deferrals as being in arrears. So you will have a monthly credit report that is identical to what you would have if you were making the payments. And I know we've got predominantly a business community here, but I wanted to uh, make sure we put that mortgage repayment opportunity there because I know for many, particularly small businesses, um, their home mortgages and their business lending is often quite interrelated. Uh, similarly, they are able to defer business loan repayments for six months. Um, and the slight difference in the language is APRA is requiring banks with the mortgage deferrals uh, to check in with the customer at three months and make sure that they still need this deferral. Uh, with the business loan, it's just a straight deferral for six months, no need for the check-in. At any time, obviously, a, a business can start repaying or start making payments if they're in a position to do so, but they won't be required to go through um, any hurdles. Uh, they're also, so that's taking the burden off of you know, the cost of repayments on loans, uh, but also, Banks have a number of opportunities um, to provide extra cash flow and to lend into the business community at the moment when we know that people have serious cash flow needs. So, as I said, um, banks will defer business loans and mortgages for six months for small and medium businesses. Uh, to date, we've had uh, more than half a million business, mortgage and other repayments deferred. So those other repayments are things like credit cards and personal loans, other forms of you know, unsecured lending. Uh, banks are also offering loans, including overdrafts for working capital to get businesses through COVID-19 and as you say, out the other side. So let me talk a little bit about the business deferrals. Businesses are effectively automatically eligible for these deferrals. Um, on a, on a, really, I've got to do two, there's only two hurdles I have to cross. And when we say business, it includes sole traders. Um, if they are a business that has total um, borrowings of up to $10 million, and they provide a, um, a self-assessment to the bank that their business has been impacted financially by COVID-19. Uh, the deferrals apply to both the principal and interest repayments. The interest uh, that is not being paid in this six months will be capitalised 
and it can then be paid off either over the life of the um, existing loan or time can be added at the end of the loan. So it will depend a bit. The customer will be um, will determine what is best for them in terms of making good that six months um, over the rest of the loan period. Um, when we say small and medium businesses, we are sector agnostic. There's not different arrangements for tourism versus education versus health versus manufacturing. Uh, the only sector that has a slightly different qualification and that is commercial landlords, uh, where banks offer a deferral of loan repayments to commercial landlords. Those landlords must provide a declaration that they will not evict tenants or um, terminate leases as a result of rent arrears caused by COVID-19 for those tenants. Uh, and I think that's an important one. Banks felt strongly that if they were offering relief to landlords, um, then the small businesses that are housed in those properties should also get some benefit. Um, so where landlords do the right thing by their tenants, banks will do the right thing by them. I should, um, well, I'll go to the next slide. Um, so some people ask me, well, why did you pick 10 million? Um, it was precisely because banks didn't want to, um, you know, sort of pick favourites or, or try to anticipate which sector might be more impacted and have more need. So they looked across their whole loan book and said, at what point in this loan book could we be comfortable uh, that if every one of those businesses applied for a deferral, that we could cope with that? So the $10 million cutoff um, accounts for 98% of all Australian businesses that have a, a loan with an Australian bank. So we don't get into, we're not, we're not trying to complicate this with what your turnover is or how many employees you have. Um, you know, you can be a relatively small business with a loan of $10 million, or you can be a very large business with a loan of you know, $5 million. We're not concerned about size. Um, for those businesses that are over that 10 million mark, it's not that there's no relief available, there is. It's just that it will be done on a much more um, case by case basis. Uh, because interestingly, um, at the 10 million mark, as I said, it's 98% of businesses by number, but it's about 50% by value. So once you get over that 10 million mark, you end up with some very big companies and some very big um, loan arrangements. They're often quite complex. They're often, the, the bank loan is part of a whole lot of other financing arrangements. So it's not, the banks are certainly offering deferrals to businesses with loans of more than 10 million, but it's far less automatic. Uh, it will require much more of a, a good look before the deferral will be granted. Whereas under 10 million, as I said, it's, it's almost automatic. Um, obviously, uh, where businesses were already in serious trouble before COVID hit, um, banks will also wanna have a much closer look at them. But for the, the overwhelming bulk of businesses with loans of less than 10 million, which is 98% of all businesses with a loan in Australia with an Australian bank, uh, you know, that, those, they're up to date. And if, if that's the case, then, you know, as I said, it's as close to automatic as we can make it. Um, as I said, uh, no further verification is required from, from business customers. They effectively just have to declare to the bank that their business has been adversely impacted. Their ability to make repayments has been impacted by COVID-19. Uh, banks are doing everything they can, as I said, to, to fast track that approval process and make it as seamless as possible. Uh, I think all of the banks now have the ability to do this online. Uh, many, many of you, I'm sure there are people on the call who have either themselves experienced or know somebody who has quite a long wait on a call centre. Uh, when we announced, um, in the week after we announced these packages, at least one of the major banks took more calls that week than they would normally take in a year. Um, no, no, one's, no one can gear up for that in a week. Uh, here we are sort of seven or eight weeks down the track and we've had um, all of the banks are redeploying staff from other parts of their businesses. Unsurprisingly, they've got very significant reductions in branch traffic. And so many of the staff who are turning up to work at branches, uh, you know, sitting on phones, staffing call centre calls. Uh, and banks right now are one of the sectors that are actually employing people. Um, literally, you know, several, you know, they've been increasing their teams 
by factors of hundreds of people. But as you'll be aware, you, you've got to train people up before they can take um, a position on a call centre. So I'll give an advance apology for those who've had trouble getting through and, and certainly say um, for these loans, um, most of the, for most banks, the fastest way to do it is to get online. Uh, happy to take questions on that. So that's the deferrals of payments. Um, for many customers, um, they may not have a loan and not have repayments. Um, or even those that do, who have an existing credit facility, an overdraft or similar, um, many people are looking, as I said, for working capital. Uh, so the government announced, um, I think around about the 30th of March, that they would be putting in place um, a government guaranteed SME loan scheme. And what they're doing is providing a 50% guarantee on new unsecured loans issued by those banks and financial institutions that are signed up to the scheme. With a government guarantee of 50% of the loan, it does a couple of things. Firstly, it means that business loans can be offered at a much cheaper rate, and they're being offered by most institutions at around half um, the previous business lending rate, somewhere around the 4, 4.5%. It also means that banks can take on higher risk borrowers, um, remembering that this is for new unsecured um, credit. Uh, so it does mean that banks can go a bit further up the risk curve than they might otherwise be able to do under their prudential requirements. There's a couple of requirements. The scheme, um, the, the, the guarantee scheme rules, so Treasury wrote a set of rules and participants have to agree to those rules. And those rules are publicly available on the Treasury website for people who want that kind of detail. Uh, but in essence, the rules have a, a couple of features. One, um, the loan has to um, have no repayments for the first six months. Uh, and it is a three-year loan term. It is available to the bank at the end of the three years to extend the term, but if they do so, it ceases to be a government guaranteed loan. So I would suggest that in many cases, there might be circumstances in which the bank is very confident, the business has been paying you know, very consistently, but they're just not gonna hit that three-year mark, and they may be willing to extend it, but it is, um, it is a very tight term um, turnaround. And I know that some banks have had businesses drop out because they don't have confidence that they could meet those terms. Uh, but that's the terms the government has set. Uh, the government will guarantee up to $20 billion. So that means that uh, that unleashes $40 billion worth of lending. As I said, it's bank banks are available. Banks are able to be part of this scheme but so are non-bank lenders and some non-bank lenders have already joined up and there will be opportunities. Um, the government is basically, what they've done is done an allocation in a first tranche um, of what a particular bank or institution thinks they'll be able to get out the door in sort of the first month or so. And it's on a use it or, or lose it basis. So if, when the government comes back and has a look, um, if a bank is significantly below um, what they thought they would be able to get out the door, they can reallocate that to another institution that's moving the money faster. So in order to be eligible for this um, loan guarantee, uh, SMEs, um, which includes both sole traders and not-for-profits, uh, are those, and this is the government's definition, they have to be businesses with a turnover of up to 50 million. So, um, you know, less than, you have to be less than 50 million turnover. The loans are up to 250,000 per borrower. There's no minimum loan size and the loan can be taken in tranches. So you might think, for example, that you need $100,000 and you take that um, in May. In August, you may feel that that was not enough and you need to increase that. Um, you can keep increasing it up to 250,000. Where you take the loan as part of an overdraft any part of a loan that is not used at the end um, of the period can be returned without, um, without fees or interest. So they're the big packages, but I do want to stress that there are lots of other things that banks can do to assist. Um, you know, there are, er there are areas that apply to some sectors of the business community, um, particularly in relation to merchant fees. While there is no, um, you know, automatic package on this. There are a number of banks who are offering merchant fee reductions or waiver periods on merchant fees and other charges. 
Um, they can offer interest-free periods or no interest rate increases. They can do debt consolidation, uh, where, where people might have a number of facilities, including you know, a credit card, a personal loan, a mortgage and a business loan. Um, that won't be suitable for every customer, but that's an option that might work for some customers. Um, and as I said, the loan deferrals for commercial landlords, which we hope does provide um, some small businesses with rent relief uh, through their landlord. Um, I've put the next one in bold because I think I, I really want to end with the message that the sooner people speak to their bank, if they, even if they just think or worry that they might be in financial difficulties um, in, in a few months' time, um, the better and sooner the bank will be able to help. Um, I think it's very human for people to be a bit reluctant to talk to their bank when they've got financial problems. Uh, and banks will tell you, unfortunately, some people come through the door and they're, they've been paying one credit card with another credit card and they're way behind on payments on another loan and it becomes very difficult. But the sooner that people um, you know, can forecast, and it's very difficult in this environment because I think for many businesses, until the government is clearer about how and when and at what pace we come out of this, it's a bit hard to plan. Uh, and I think even if the, when the government does make all of that clear, none of us really know how customers will behave, how quickly customers will come back into restaurants or large conferences or football games, or that's just an unknown. Uh, so with those words, I'm going to finish there, Amy, and happy to um, take questions. Okay. Thank you very much for that overview, Anna. I think, um, you know, it really has been information overload uh, over the last few weeks for people in business um, in terms of what's coming out from government and other stakeholders. And, um, you know, it's really hard sometimes for people to navigate the assistance that is available to them. Um, so it's very useful to get that that um, insight from you. Can I ask you um, what sort of demand you're seeing for the, the main measures for things like loan deferrals and, and the, the guaranteed loans? Have you had any statistics on that to date? Uh, I do. Um, as of last Friday, and we're looking at doing this data count quite regularly now, but um, as of last Friday, there were half a million um, loan deferrals. Uh, 320,000 of those were mortgages and 170,000 of those were um, loan repayments, sorry, business loan repayments, and 37,000 were other loans such as credit cards or personal loans. So up over half a million mark, which I think, you know, that's been processed in about three and a half weeks. It tells you there's a lot of pain out there and a lot of distress and a lot of people, you know, I think particularly, you know, for households, for most households, their mortgage payment is the single biggest outgoing and uh, for small businesses, um, their rent and their, their business loan are two of their biggest outgoings. So uh, to the extent that we can provide that relief, but re requests and approvals are you know, continuing to proceed at a very fast pace and hopefully we'll be in a position to, um, so that's nearly a week ago. It will have increased significantly since then. Um, there's been a total of new lending in the last, um, since the beginning of March of $45 billion, which is a staggering amount. Now, not, not all of that is through the SME loan guarantee scheme. And some of, the, some of that 45 billion is what, would you, what you would know as the institutional part of the bank. You know, very big businesses taking on very significant lending. Uh, but a lot of it um, uh, is in the SME space and the average you know, loans in that space are less than 100 and most of those are less than 50,000 at this stage. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have the yes, the current S guarantee, but uh, yeah, that is certainly being rolled out. Um, you know, literally again in the in the in the in the thousands. I don't know if it's hundreds of thousands yet, but it's certainly in the tens of thousands. Yeah, obviously, people are needing access, you know, to this money or or, or, or these deferrals. If if it, if that's the case, um, fairly quickly. How are the banks managing with that huge, you know, influx of of applications and, uh, to administer and and, and get these these arrangements organised, um, you know, in, in a timely manner? Yes, well, as I said earlier, they're drinking from a fire hydrant um, and they're all gearing, they're all ramping up their call centres, um, which is the, and, um, and putting online and, and significantly improving online capacity to take applications um, and turn those around where they can. Uh, in relation, one thing I didn't talk about is um, banks are also in a position to provide 
a kind of any you know sort of bridging finance if you like either through that SME loan guarantee or through another existing facility that the customer might ha customer might have such as an extension to an overdraft um, to help people um, get through uh, and make the payments to staff for April in order for that business to qualify for JobKeeper. Uh, and because of that urgency around JobKeeper and the tight timeframes, banks have put in place um, individualised dedicated hotline numbers. Uh, so if people are looking for credit to get them through to JobKeeper payments, there is dedicated hotlines. And I know that they are not being, well, they're certainly getting plenty of calls, but um, they're not being so inundated that the turnaround, that the time to answer on those calls are um, um, significantly better than, um, you know, the much more general lines. Because uh, some of the calls on the general lines you'll appreciate are very distressed. Um, and, you know, calls that might have once taken half an hour are taking, or taken 20 minutes and now taking 45 minutes because you've got customers in a great deal of distress. So. Um, I can certainly provide, Amy, we'll, we can send you and you might send it to your members, the list of hotline numbers for every bank in yep. relation to the JobKeeper payment. Uh, that would be great. Yes, we will sure share that with everybody. I did want to ask you specifically about JobKeeper because as that program has rolled out, um, that, that issue has caused a bit of pain for some small businesses in that they've got to cover those payments uh, until such time as the ATO uh, reimburses them. Um, and for some people with a lot of employees, that's a, that's a that's a large number. Um, but also moving forward, we, they've got the issue, I think uh, uh, JobKeeper's only reimbursed monthly, whereas whereas some employees are having to pay their, their staff weekly or fortnightly. So could you explain to us a little bit more about how those specific arrangements for JobKeeper are panning out? It, it, is it a bank by bank arrangement? Uh, well, every bank is offering um, some form of credit or finance to assist businesses who need a bridging, um, bridging credit, if you like. Uh, in order to qualify for JobKeeper, uh, for the first JobKeeper payment, you have to demonstrate that you have paid your employees at least $1,500 um, you know, per fortnight for the month of April. And I think you have until May the 8th to make that payment. Um, and so it, some banks have a couple of banks have actually designed a particular product, um, which is an, an, a, an overdraft style product. Others are using much more the SME guarantee loan. Um, but it, so basically people take out the credit, take out the loan, they pay their staff in arrears for the month of April. Uh, they then get a JobKeeper payment. But of course, um, you know, they then need to be able to pay their workers at the end of May with that. So. Uh, I think banks are anticipating that repayments of that bridging finance are probably not going to happen in most businesses till the end of the six months when their last payment, when they're back and operating, their last JobKeeper payment, instead of being paid in arrears to their staff, um, can then be used to pay back the bank. Okay. Uh, we've got a question from Wayne Demar here who, who would like to know whether the banks have um, fixing their interest rates during and after the three-year period or um, are they likely to uh, go back up again after that period's over? Uh, look, that's a good question. Wayne, I can't, sorry, I can't give you a detailed answer for every bank, but my understanding is that they're being offered by and large on a fixed basis. Um, and I, that's what I think the... I'd have to check the scheme rules to see if that's required. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you think about it, I don't think we're going to see significant interest rate rises in that uh, in that three-year period it's possible that in the third year um, there might be some lift all right uh, we had a, a another, it. sorry <laughs> uh, pre, pre submitted question from hamish firth um while many of these measures are designed to keep businesses trading and in business there will unfortunately be some that don't survive this period and have to to close. Um, some of those operators may look at, at going into a new line of business with a new business model. Um, what sort of back assistance can banks offer to people who are starting over uh, um, as a result of COVID? Uh, yes, and I think it is, I think it's important for us all to be, you know, very honest about this. I think um, banks and the government and, uh, and everybody who can is sort of, you know, bending over backwards to keep people in employment and keep businesses afloat. But there is a, it's a very rare thing for an economic crisis of this nature uh, to end with everybody still intact. And that's going to be, there's going to be some very tough um, 
uh, situations for many people. Uh, so I think there's two things I'd say in that relation to that, Amy. Firstly, at a more general level, banks are very conscious that the six month period um, you know, may need to be reassessed with APRA. There may, need, may be some businesses that just need a little bit longer on those loan repayment holidays. Now we're still having those conversations with the regulator, but we're very conscious that not everybody's going to be you know, in the same place at that six month cutoff. Um, but secondly, on your more general point, just as there has been a really important role for banks coming into this crisis to sort of be the shock absorber, as I said earlier, I think the, um, the, the big role for banks coming out of the crisis is to make sure that they are, continue to be in a strong capital position so that they can fund the recovery. Uh, you know, this is going to impact different sectors in different ways. You know, some are going to suffer for longer and, and feel it more painfully. Uh, for others, there's going to be whole new opportunities. So whether it's a business that is starting over or a business that has been able to see a growth opportunity because of changed customer behaviour, banks need to be in a position and they're the sort of discussions we're having with government and with the regulators. Um, so, you know, I said earlier, banks had, you know, there'd been a lot of work done in the last decade since the GFC. And probably the big feature of that has been requirements by the regulator uh, in, for banks to hold bigger capital buffers. And uh, that's what they've done. And that's why they've gone into this so well capitalised. The regulator has given banks um, dispensation to bite into those buffers because those buffers are there for a rainy day and right now we're, we're having a stormy day and that's what they're there for. Um, we'll have to keep working with the regulator coming out of this recovery um, to make sure that uh, those buffers can be available, you know, in a prudent way uh, to fund people in exactly the circumstances that you're talking about. Okay, well, on, on the topic of recovery, we've got a question from Bob Hawes. Um, it's going to be important to get the economy going as soon as COVID-19 restrictions are eased. So are the banks in regular dialogue with the government to get a collaborative view on how recovery might occur from a finance sector viewpoint and what reforms might be needed to achieve growth? Um, thank you. Uh, yes, I can assure you we are in regular contact um, with government, both with the um, political end of government and the bureaucratic end, um, Treasury, is doing a lot of work with banks. Banks, you know, if you, banks have a lot of information that they hold in their, um, in their lending books and in their transaction data that can um, inform Treasury about which sectors, you know, there's a lot of in, rich and deep insights in that data about sec, on a sector basis, on a geographic basis, uh, and on a household basis. So uh, banks are working and, and literally sitting down with Treasury on a regular basis to talk about this is what we're seeing in our book, this is what we're seeing in our um, household transaction data, and all of that's informing Treasury's thinking about what a recovery, you know, what are the challenges for recovery uh, and where are the opportunities. Uh, we're also working, um, there is, Treasury's basically got two big teams at the moment. One is working on recovery and the other is working, um, you know, in a more macroeconomic sense and the other is working on um, what might be a, a regulatory agenda uh, that will facilitate recovery. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, in every crisis, there's always opportunities. And uh, what we have, um, what we've seen from, so just at a bank level, by just as one example, um, we have some very antiquated laws um, around the country that require certain documents uh, to be signed in person um, and, you know, in hard copy. And, um, We've been lobbying for about 10 years on this because it's 2020 and trying to get a much more digital um, solution. And, uh, you know, interestingly, of course, with people in, in social isolation and quarantine, we've had people who have had house settlements that had to be um, achieved in the last three weeks that, um, or, or mortgage documents. Um, and so the state governments and the federal government have all passed in the last couple of weeks um, using their emergency powers they've all passed laws that will facilitate the use of e-signatures and digital identity um, on, the, on all of those sorts of legal documentation. Um, our challenge now is to make sure that they don't just stay as temporary measures with the emergency laws, but actually become a permanent feature um, of the banking and finance landscape. Um, so that's an example of one that we're pushing very hard. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of inefficiency across the finance system around 
those requirements for hard copy documents and face-to-face -face verifications. Um, so that's just one example, but there's lots of discussions happening. And I can assure your members that, um, you know, the government, um, treasury and the regulators and banks, um, you know, we're talking almost daily about some of these things. And, uh, you know, I think government's got some very big, um, you know, they've got big agendas to try to work through. So, you know, in the banking industry, the other big one for um, the industry is all of the recommendations out of the Royal Commission, which is another, you know, it's, it's about 40 pieces of new legislation. So um, the government, of course, hasn't, the parliament hasn't, there's barely sat for this first half of the year. So that, um, that time frame is blown out. But, uh, you know, we're certainly looking to get those things done and off the agenda as quickly as possible. Uh, just a quick question. People may be worried about how uh, deferring their small business payments or entering into some sort of um, arrangement over this period may affect their credit rating. Can you give us any assurances in that regard? Uh, certainly. So banks are required to um, report to credit agencies um, for mortgages um, uh, in relation to both investment mortgages and um, owner occupier, but they are not required to report to credit rating agencies in relation to business lending. Uh, so it won't affect if you take a um, if you take a loan deferral on your business loan, it doesn't have any impact. Uh, and if you take one on your mortgage, as I said earlier, we have reached an agreement across the sector and with all of the credit agencies that deferrals that are granted as part of this package and are related to COVID-19 will not be recorded as arrears. They will be recorded monthly as if the customer um, was making a payment. Okay. Well, we've just about come to the end of the time, but I'd like to ask you just as somebody, um, you know, who has a lot of gov experience in government and business sectors, what, what's your advice for businesses to, for getting through this crisis? Uh, <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> You know, firstly, I'd say, go back to repeating what I said, you know, right now people need their banks to be their partners uh, and people who are worried, people who don't, even if you're just confused or don't know what might be available, you know, talk to your bank as early as you possibly can. Uh, you know, I think in more general terms around leadership, I'd say two things. And one is, you know, we all talk about our people are our most important asset. Uh, but I think for leaders, there's been a, this has been a really challenging time. Um, to keep your people together, to keep their morale up, to give them information, to give them certainty. So I don't think leaders at this time can spend too much time, uh, you know, making sure they keep connecting with their people um, who are, you know, experiencing their own levels of fear and distress and financial hardship. Uh, and, this, and the last one I would make is, I think, you know, it's one of the tasks of leadership in a crisis to look for the both, um, to be ready for the challenges, because there will be many as we come out, but also to look for the opportunities. Um, you know, there are very few crises that don't have opportunities in them to come back and do things differently and better and to innovate. I think we've all been forced to innovate in the last, um, you know, six to eight weeks. And in many industries, we've seen, um, you know, the telehealth's a great example, 10 years of disruption done in four weeks. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a kind of writ large example, but um, there'll be very few businesses because necessity has forced them to operate differently to, to get revenue uh, that can become a completely different business model. So, you know, I think that's what organisations need leaders to do is to be looking around the corner and identifying those opportunities, keeping their people, you know, as close and part of a team as they can uh, and making sure you've got the resources to do what you need to do. And that's about talking to your bank. Thanks for that, Anna. Yeah, we certainly have been all forced to innovate, and the fact that we're speaking you to you today over a screen instead of um, uh, at a lunch venue uh, is one example of that. Uh, thank you again for, for giving us your time today. That information and those insights have been really valuable for our members um, and uh, as, as they you know seek to navigate through this period. I'll just pass over to Bob to wind up from here. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, um, and thanks again, Anna. Uh, that was um, very insightful, and um, I, I also feel for the banks themselves, you know, at the time when, uh, as you've noted there, having to, you've got um, uh, forces on them to actually take on more people when their own P&Ls and balance sheets are being smashed. So it is unprecedented and difficult times, and, um, and, and I'm really 
pleased with the way you uh, outlined that information today because it does sound like that um, uh, we're all at least all heading in the same thinking in the same direction. And I really hope some of the stimulus packages that are out there do work. Um, and, uh, and we don't all fall off a cliff at the end, but I'm um, hoping that uh, the government and uh, other um, regulatory agencies that are saying they're keeping a close eye on things and, and looking after us um, will do so. And I'm, and I'm glad the banks are in regular conversation with government about that um, because it's very important that they get that message back. And as you say, the data and the information that the banks have is, um, is very vital. I really appreciate the time you've taken out of your very busy diary to be with us today and, and, and being part of our series. And as, as Amy said, we would have been delighted to have welcomed you to lunch overlooking the, uh, the beaches of Newcastle, one of our delightful venues, and hopefully that opportunity might avail itself at some time in the future.